Fantastic. Great to be here at Moray Field. Just want to thank the band. Isn't that great? We just got great musicians. And what I love is seeing new people come and see Emily here on piano. You got a good touch on piano too, Emily. Very nice. I like that. Fantastic. So come on, let's give them. You can give a better hand than that. They work hard. They do very well. And uh, now they have to do double as well because they're doing it twice, right? So, uh, but you know, one of the great things about God is that nothing's actually just doubled. He just does something else, right? So even though this is a great service, God moves. God's going to do something else in the next service because he isn't kind of bereft of ideas. God is always wanting to move and always wanting to do something wonderful. So congratulations on going to two services. And I want to say you have immediate effect because straight away we had over 300 for the first time come to Morayfield. Come on, let's give God a praise. You know, for a church that five years ago didn't exist and now is happening and doing all sorts of things, I think that's pretty fantastic. And we give all the glory to God and, uh, and for all the people who just work hard and do all these different things. And, and I know that it's onerous on those who are volunteers, right? So you have to come early, stay a little bit late. And, and we're going to be trying to do everything we can to make sure we're not going to kill any volunteers. Right? I said to Joe, no killing of volunteers, all right? But there's always just that little bit of stretch. And, that, and that's one of the things in God, because we want to get the gospel out. We want to get the good news of Jesus out. And everyone said? Amen. And what I've noticed is that people love options. So I'm thinking about going 8.30, 10.30, 12.30. No, no, not really. All right. So uh, fantastic. So uh, uh, as Nina said, summits this week, we bang on about it, not because I want a crowd. We've already got a crowd. Right? It's not like I need more people to come because somehow that fills my ego because we've got to fill big room. Right? We do it because we come together as family. It's not Moray Field, it's not Redcliffe, it's not Warner, it's not Youth Group, it's not Adult. It's, it's all of us together, right? coming together and giving God the opportunity. And when you give God the opportunity over a few days to kind of like sit in His presence, where you're not distracted by this, distracted by that, all these other things going on in your life, but you just take some time out and you just say, God, here I am. What do you want to do? How can you do? I'm ready for you to do. And then all of a sudden, God always comes to that hungry heart. So really what we look at it as is that we provide the opportunity for you to come. right? So if you're not coming because you can't afford it, well, we'll make a way. We'll sort something out. Don't let money be the reason that you're not there. We'll make a way. We want to cover our costs, but we're not going to be foolish about it. It's like, you didn't pay. And, you know, we have never changed the price either. It's always just been the same. And that. But money is just helps us do what we do, but it shouldn't stop anyone from being there. So talk to Nikki, talk to Joe, talk to Jack, talk to one of your leaders, and we'll work out something, right? But please don't be at home. Because, you know, uh, I can't afford it. That, that would be horrible and that's what I don't like. All right, so let me pray. Father, I ask that you would take this message, which really is a portion of me, oh God. Father, I pray that as I speak this message, your heart, would come through this, O oh Lord. Father, help me communicate it, O oh Lord, and take it and let it speak to people. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Today is a, a little bit of a different message. Normally, I might find a scripture or some things, a, a topic in the Bible, and I'll go through that and I'll talk about some of those things. And, and uh, you know, we'll, we've got a journey. We're going to start here and we're going to get to there. But today is something a little bit different in the world. I'm just going to kind of like throw it out there, just kind of see what happens and, and all of that because today I want to speak about having been in ministry for 30 years. So on the 8th of October, so 8th of August uh, two, uh, 1994, I came into full-time ministry. And so that was 30 years ago. So today I'd like to talk to you about some of the things that I've learned and some of the things I find important over 30 years. And to be honest, it has been 30 years of learning. 
and I haven't known it yet and I've still got a lot to know. So when it's 31 years, I will have learnt for 31 years and so on and so on. So not long after being saved, I knew that I wanted to be a pastor. When I got saved, I didn't even know you could be a pastor. I'd never heard of a pastor. I'd heard of a priest, but I never knew you could be a pastor. But I wasn't long in church and I said, I want to do that. I want to give everything I can to just serving God and doing what God wants. I went from being someone who just smoked drugs and drank and had no idea about church to someone who was in church all the time. There was a prayer meeting at 6 in the morning. I would be there. I remember walking 7 kilometers at 6 in the morning, leaving a half past sort of get to the prayer meeting because I just wanted to go, right? And I just had this hunger to serve God and to be in the kingdom of God. And being in church has never been hard. 45 years I've been a Christian and 45 years I love going to church. On my holidays, I still go to church. It's not like my job, I've got to be here because I have to. I like church. It's never been hard and I knew that I wanted to be a pastor. So I thought I would do Bible college. So not long after getting saved, I did two years of Bible college and I thought this will certainly make me qualified to be a pastor. How wrong I was. Right? And I thought God would give me a position, but no position opened up. And I thank God that he didn't answer that prayer. Because there was so much in me that needed to be dealt with, right? And two years of Bible college was never going to even begin to touch the surface of what God actually needed to do. See, I needed to learn how to work hard. I'd been on the unemployed for years. I hadn't had a job, ever had a job before then. So I actually had to learn how to work, to actually work some hours. And God put me in a job that I hated to do, but... He had to teach me to work. And every time I'd want to quit, he'd go, no, you stay, you stay. And I'd want to quit, no, you stay. Because it wasn't about the work, it was about me learning how to work. Right? And then like I I, I needed to learn how to work unsupervised because anyone can work if the boss is watching. But are you going to still work hard when no one's actually watching you? And I needed to learn that because in ministry, you have to work, but you also have to work unsupervised. And then I had to learn how to work, work unsupervised, but then also have a measure of achievement to actually see something happen. And so God took years to to do all of those different things. I had to learn how to serve when things went good. I had to learn how to serve when things went bad. I had to learn to trust God and make sure it was Him that I was serving, not my own personal ambitions. I had to learn how to forgive. I had to learn how to get over an offence. I had to learn to do with my own weaknesses and, and counter the thinking that 20 years of living a sinful life had caused me to think like. I had to counter all of those things and renew my mind according to the things of God. I had to learn from my disappointments, my setbacks, and I had to learn from the felt injustices that I saw or that I felt were perpetrated upon me. You know, God placed me in a great church and with great leaders and, and he used them to mould me and to, and to shape me. And, and even if at times I didn't appreciate what it was that they were doing, I knew that God was actually doing something. And, and just recently I got to spend a few hours with Pastor Ashley Evans, the pastor of uh, Futures Church, and, and I just came away stirred. I just came away encouraged because I'd placed myself for years under his leadership and now, even now, he can just speak into my spirit and into my life because God did that in my life. But in 1994, Pastor Ashley rang me and it asked me if I would come on staff in our youth group. Part-time, not full-time, part-time. And I was going to look after new people and I was going to look after new Christians. When I came on staff, I never, ever thought I would hold a microphone. I never ever thought I would preach a message. I never ever thought that the upfront was going to be what God had called me to. I was just there to serve people. And that's what I wanted to do and I was happy to do that. But it was a, it was a, a sacrifice. I had a good job. I was being paid well. I had a company car and I could travel and, and kind of set my own kind of way. And, and I was good at it. I was successful at what I did and and so all of a sudden I had to give all that up, give up my company car, right, and get paid 
the princely sum of $800 a month, right? And I went, yeah, <laughs> right? Like, I went, yeah, I was so happy to do that. I was so happy to do that. It was a, it was a privilege. Now, the reason that I know the date is this, is that like I had a little while before that in 1990 been asked to become the youth pastor of a church in Newcastle. So I was living in Adelaide and asked me to come a church in, in Newcastle, asked me if I'd become the youth pastor. And I thought about it. It was a fantastic opportunity. The leadership and the pastor of that church was a well-known and, and reputable pastor. And the church was good. And, and good people were telling me that I should think about it and I should do it. And, and I prayed about it. But God spoke to me and he says, where your heart is, your treasure will be. Now, the scripture actually says where your treasure is, your heart will be. So it's a bit of a turnaround. But God said to me, your heart is here at Paradise. It was called Paradise Community Church back then. Your heart is here, right? And, and, and that's where you'll come into ministry. But I thought, it's impossible, there were too many people in positions. Too, I, I wasn't cool enough. I wasn't gifted enough. I wasn't uh, able to speak well enough. I, there were so many more gifted people, talented people, and it was impossible that I would ever come on staff at Paradise. But I knew what God had said. And so four years. So what I did is that I actually notated that in the Bible. And I actually put right, the 8th of the 8th, 1990. So when I wrote my letter to accept the position, I looked for that scripture and I saw that I was writing on the 8th of the 8th, 1994, four years to the day, right, that God gave me that promise and here it was, my promise coming to pass. And I just want to say, God's promises are there. God's promises are there. God comes true and it's awesome to trust in God with your future. So let me give you 10 paradoxes of ministry. And then what I'm going to give you is just some Mark Elmendorf-isms, right? Just things that I've learned and some things that I just think are true. I don't know if they're true, but they're true to me, so they may as well be true. And then you'll understand me a little bit more as well. So a paradox is a little bit like, is, is, is like when a statement is true, but there's another statement which seems opposite, but that's also true. So two seemingly different statements, but both are true. Understand? So let me read number one, paradox number one. It's all about the people, not you. The paradox is this. It's all about you, not the people. Let me explain. So my first role in any sort of ministry before I came on full-time ministry was to lead a life group. And I, I just thought it was too much. I was barely kind of having any custody of my own life. And now all of a sudden I've got responsibility for these 12 other people, right? And so and I, I wanted it to grow. And, and so I, I started with 12 and I'd pray for these people every day, or so every Wednesday, and I'd fast every Wednesday for life group. And, and I'd pray and I'd have this little exercise book and I'd write their name and then I'd write some goal for them and, and, and I'd pray for them. And I started to pray, God, let me have 15. Let me have. And then I remember clearly God speaking to me one day and said, don't pray for the growth of the group. Don't pray for numbers. Pray for the growth in the people. Right? And if people grow, then whatever it is that you're running and leading will actually grow. See, if I make it about numbers, pride, oh, look how good I am, look how it's growing, or self-pity, oh, no one's coming, I must be terrible. One of those emotions is going to take over if you make it about numbers alone. It becomes about you. It becomes about your self-esteem. And once it's about you, you don't end up walking by faith, you end up walking by sight. And God clearly tells us that this is a faith walk. And then what happens is that you place people above the line or below the line. So you sit there and say, oh, you're helping me, so you're a good guy. Right? Oh, you're not helping me, I don't care about you. And what happens is that you become transactional in your relationships. And I want to say, 
That is not the kingdom of God. That is, God doesn't put us above and below the line. He loves us all equally. Right? So God showed me that, that I had to pray for the growth in people, that it's about people, it's not about me. But paradoxically, it is about me and not the people. See, if I live only to please people, then I'm going to become the most miserable man on earth. You know, one moment they're singing, Hosanna to Jesus, the King is coming. Yeah. Right? And they're throwing their coats on the ground. Yeah. And a week later, they're yelling, release Barabbas, crucify him. Right? You can't just listen to the, to the uh, cries or the opinions of people because I'll never please people all the time. But my goal has to be, I need to please God. And so what happens is my personal relationship with Jesus is my most personal responsibility. I have to allow the important to usurp the, 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 the urgent, right? And it's important that my ministry comes because I've sat at the feet of Jesus, not because I've just had a heart to serve. So that's paradox number one. Paradox number two is family is priority, family has to wait. You know, when I came to Brisbane, it was difficult. My three kids and Nina wanted to be back in Adelaide. Can you believe that? We, I can't believe it. And Nina can't believe it anymore. All right? So I had to pastor my house before I could ever properly pastor the church. I need things to be stable in my home so that then there'll be stability in leading God's house. And so I've made my home and my close personal relationships very much a priority. I remember one night just counselling a team night. So we've advertised team night Tuesday, team night Tuesday, team night Tuesday. That afternoon, no, nah, we're not doing it because my family needed me at that time. There would have been people put out. There would have been people a bit upset. But at that time, my family needed me. I needed to do that. And I don't feel guilty about that. You know, I think one of the strengths of Emerge Church is that I actually do love Nina. Right? It's not a fake. Right? It's not, a, it's not an act. Right? I actually do love Nina. And I, I'm pretty sure she loves me. Right? So, uh, right? So, and I believe that you actually all feel a little bit safer because of that. Does that make sense? I actually believe that. I, I, it's, it's real, it's not made up. You know, I almost left the Merge Church because of my commitment to family. Nina and the kids weren't enjoying it here. And I said, honey, we've we got to stay at least three years. We, we made a commitment, at least stay three years. We just can't up and leave now. And I said, but in three years' time, if you still feel the same, we will go. Right? We will go back to Adelaide. I'm not unemployable. Someone will give me a job. Right? And, and so I went there and then things just started to slowly change. And then just at that three-year mark, someone came to me, drove, flew all the way to Brisbane to tell me they felt God tell them that I should take the church there in Adelaide, a church in Adelaide, right? And, and I was just like, no, I know I'm meant to be here. And then I talked to Nina. She didn't even pray about it because we know where you're meant to be. And I thank God that, that he has a plan. You understand that, that God has a plan. But in saying that, family has to wait. Many times a family has had to share me with church. I'm out. I'm away. I've missed many important milestones. I was in the US for Nina's 40th birthday. In Jack's, in the middle of Jack's uh, 21st dinner, we had to leave because someone had died suddenly and it was a horrible situation. I missed Rachel's formal because I was on a missions trip. I've missed probably almost all of Tori's birthdays, or Ivy Tori's birthdays. Missed her 21st completely because she's on, because uh, I was at state conference. And then this year, put our staff retreat on, right, right in the middle of her birthday. And, uh, but she's a very forgiving, loving <laughs> child. All right, so, uh, you know, they wanted me there. They're disappointed that I wasn't. But they understood sometimes the church wins. But because they know that they're first, they don't begrudge it at times when they become second. 
And that's because I have kept my house in order. But sometimes God's house needs me more at a particular time. All right, number three. Sitting at the feet of Jesus is crucial, but getting out and serving is vital. Now, all my life verses, and you would have heard if you heard me preach more than twice, you would have heard me speak about life verses. They're, they're, they're important to me because I believe we need to establish and, 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 and have a foundation on the Word of God for our lives. So one of my life verses is Isaiah 50 verse 4. And it says this, The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned that I may speak or that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens my ear. Morning by morning he awakens my ear to hear as the learned. You know, as a pastor, I, I want to be able to speak a word of life into people's weariness. Right? That, that people are doing it tough. That, that people aren't going so well. That there's something that I, I, I can say is going to bring a, a measure of encouragement, a measure of strength. But it can't be manna from a hundred years ago. Right? There's things that I've learned. There's things that I've done. But what's fresh? What have I heard now? One of the things our staff hears all the time says, you are a Christian first, a follower of Jesus first before you're a pastor before you're a leader, before you're a husband, before you're anything, you're a follower of Jesus first. Be a Christian, yeah. right? Follow Jesus. Follow me and I will make you. That's our theme this year. So, so I have to have that sense that, that God is in something. Right? I don't want to do something because it's just a good idea. Someone church down the road is doing it. I remember clearly having a shower and God said, put on a summit. I don't even know what a summit was, right? And I just put on a summit because the church needs to feel proud of being together. And what happens is that's what happens. You're glad you're part of a merged church because you realize it's not just here, it's all of us. It's not just what I'm in for, it's all of us. And together God does something and brings unity. My ministry has to be fresh. It has to be, has to be real. right? I, I, I like to preach. I had to choose today between this sermon and one that I did just recently because then I just got out of my devotions on a Tuesday morning here. Oh, look at that. Hopefully the, the words that I preach, the things that I'm doing are fresh. Let me tell you, I learned something in the book of John, a book that I've actually lectured on, and I'm going, when did they put that in there? Come on, I've read this a hundred times. This has just been added, right? Like, and it's just, oh my goodness, right? A fantastic truth and maybe next time I'm here I'll preach that, right? But I, I want it to be fresh. My ministry has to be fresh, has to be God. I have to get my energy and verve from God. I can't just be motivated by leadership principles or what the church down the road is doing. It has to be originated in my relationship with Jesus. That's my refreshing Right? Refreshing doesn't come from having a holiday. Nina and I just had a holiday. We came back like ready to go. But real refreshing comes when I hear, what is God saying? Times of refreshing come from the presence of God. A holiday might give you some energy for a while, but two weeks later you're just as tired again. But when you hear something fresh in God, when you hear something new in God, oh, I'm going to go again. I'm going to go again. I'm going to go again. And it's easier to do. In leading this church, I can't move forward with things I don't feel have a biblical foundation or I haven't felt from God. I just need to do that. But you know what? I just can't sit down and sing Kumbaya to Jesus all day long either. Right? I've actually got to do something. So getting out and serving is vital. I have to, I, I have to get everything from God. I have to have my biblical ideology in God. But I have to go out and do stuff. As a senior pastor, I have to identify needs. I have to meet needs. I have to identify leaders. I have to train leaders and disciple them. I have to identify issues. Right? I just noticed when I came in here that there's a tripping hazard on that door. Like you could easily trip there when you're looking at my eyes to say hello. Boom, you could trip over. So watch out when you go out there, all right? But next week, there'll be caution tape there, trust me, right? <laughs> right? So you have to get out and do the work of the ministry. And it is 
the work of the ministry. And every volunteer said, yeah. right? See, you'd work. All of a sudden, you only had to go to church once on Sunday. If you're volunteering now, you're going to have to do a whole Sunday. Right? It's the work of the ministry. But the work comes first from sitting at Jesus' feet like Mary so that you can go and serve like Martha. But without sitting at the feet of Jesus, you'll always be anxious. That's what Jesus says about Martha. Why are you anxious, Martha? Right? When you sit at the feet of Jesus first, the anxiousness of ministry isn't there. If you're completely anxious all the time, maybe you've got to come back and sit at the feet of Jesus for a time. Number four, there is no one thing that will change everything. There is one thing that you need to be concentrated on right now. In church, people will tell you, it's all about evangelism. We have to get out there and evangelise. No, it's all about discipleship. We've got a discipleship. That's what Jesus said. No, it's all about praise and worship. We've got to have a, 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 uh, a, a, an encounter with God. No, it's all about the unsaved. We've got to be like, no, we've got to. It's all these different things are focused. We've got to be concentrating on the youth group because the youth group, they're, 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 that's where people get saved. No, young adults, young adults are the group we've got to be concentrated on because like, oh, you know, they're, they're all leaving the church right now. So you can be betwixt and betwixt and people will tell you all the time, if you just do this, it'll change everything. But I want to say there's no one thing that changes everything. There's literally no one thing. It's not just all about prayer. It's not just all about teaching. It's not just all about the prophetic. It's all of those things. And when you put all of those things into action, then you start to see something. Everything has its time. Everything has its season. But there is one thing you need to be concentrated on right now. Right now, we're having a little bit of a discipleship focus. Follow me and I will make you. That's the theme of the year. So what I do is I believe we put so we put on different courses all the year. There's been different courses. We've had to do the Valiant Man in the, in a couple of weeks' time. I'm going to introduce this incredible Bible study. We've got this real Bible scholar in our church. He's going to be doing this Bible study thing. It's going to be amazing because that's our focus right now. But that doesn't mean it's got to be there forever because next year might be evangelism. I'm making it up now. I have no idea. All right. I think I got a bit of an idea, but uh, I don't know. All right, so, but there is one thing you need to be kind of, themes and focuses enable God to get the best out of us. We have to be all-rounders, but there is always something God is working on as a church, but also in your own lives. Right now, God is working on me in the area of forbearance. Not patience, but forbearance. When I don't think well of someone, but I'm supposed to think well of someone. And I'll tell you what's happening all the time, right? I'm driving in the outside lane, not the inside lane. I'm driving on the outside lane, 80 kilometers an hour, 100 kilometers an hour, 70 kilometers an hour, whatever it be, and someone's going 52. <laughs> and let me tell you, this happens so much, it can't be an accident, <laughs> right? Like, I'm so mad. The other day, I'm driving along this house, it's 80. There's a moped in the outside lane. Now, that's reasonable to get angry over. I don't care what you say, it's, but forbearance. Forbearance. That's what God is trying to teach me right now. And so Nina actually starts to laugh because she goes, it's just God grinding your gears, right? So, so it, it, it's, it's true. See, the Holy Spirit is teaching me forbearance and I just hope I learn it quickly because it's driving me nuts. All right. Number five, I'm perfect in Christ, seated in heavenly places with him. I'm a flawed and failed human. I know I'm flawed. You said yep a little bit quick there, Fiona. <laughs> just want to say that. All right. I'm flawed and I know I fail. Yes, that's how you should know. So I know I'm not the perfect pastor. I'm going to move on. By any stretch of the imagination, and that my humanness is there for all to see. You might 
imitate me as I imitate Christ, but please don't build your life on me. I'll let you down. Build your life on Jesus. Jesus will never let you down. But having said that, I'm also perfect in Christ. Right? I'm forgiven, set free and whole in Jesus. But I won't rely on my own righteousness. I'll always trust in his righteousness because my righteousness will never be enough. Number six, good leaders and staff make everything easier, but it's God who builds the house. I think Moray Field is a great example of that. We've got great and fantastic leaders, but it's God who has brought the increase. And we give the glory to him. You know, we start all sorts of different things. We recently started a a mentoring program for young women. See, God spoke to me really on and said he would send me laborers for the harvest. And we have great staff. We have staff that are the envy of uh, so many other people that I know who are running churches. You know, when I talk to a lot of my friends who are pastoring churches, it's, it's their staff that are giving them the most trouble. And I just laugh. I go, we have none of that trouble. My trouble's the opposite. We're having to start paying them long service leave, right? <laughs> right? These other guys are just not getting past probation, right? So uh, we just thank God. Well, that's a good problem to have. Now, is it Clive? But uh, uh, right, Clive's a treasurer, right? So, uh, <laughs> you know, I love my staff. I love our leaders. I place high demands on them and I expect a lot from them but they meet them every time. But though they plant and water and care, it is God who gives the increase. And I'm so glad that he's given us leaders that can grow and handle the increase, but who also won't steal away the glory, but give the glory to God. You'll never hear Joe sit there and go, oh, I'm awesome. You're lucky you got me as your pastor. Right? I, I, I hope he's never said that. Right? But <laughs> I'm pretty confident he hasn't. Right? See, because we give the glory to God because that's where the glory comes from. It's he who gives the increase. All right. Who's getting something out of this? There is never enough. Number seven, that God can feed 5,000 with some loaves and vision, some fishes. You know, my vision for Immersed Church will always be bigger than what we have. We'll always need more leaders. We'll always need more money, more opportunity, more volunteers, more departments, more salvations, more locations, more skills, more resource, more people. But instead of lamenting the lack, I love what we do have. And I actually think as a church, we do pretty well with the things that God has placed in our hands. You know, recently I did the Provision for the Vision video and as I started listing all the things that we do in local, in church, and in around the state, around Australia, around the world, and I listed all the places where we've got something, I go, we're actually doing pretty well with what God has put on our hands, and then there's an abundance and an increase. God's given us some loaves and fishes, but we're seeing great fruit that comes out of that. Number eight, people love you, people hate you. 10% of people love me. I can't do anything wrong in their eyes. If I were to punch them in the nose, they would look at me and go, yes, the Lord told you to humble me. I thank you so much that you were obedient to that. Right? Then there's 10% of people who hate you. You give them $1,000 and they go, why didn't you give me two? Does it make sense, right? So you can't... Ah. Right? Some people think you're the greatest pastor in the world because you waved at them in the car park. Right? Oh, man, that guy loves me. He's so caring. Right? Oh, look at him. He's such a good... Right? And there's other people that you visit five times a week. You do this. You give them that. Rah, rah, and then one day you don't shake their hands in the, in the foyer because you're talking to someone else and I'm leaving. You don't care. Right? It's just, it's just how people are. But you know that? You, that can't be the arbiter of how you treat people. It just can't be. I love the fact that the washing of the feet, that Jesus washes the feet of Judas as well as the feet of the other disciples. People come, people go. Emerged church, believe it or not, is not the whole kingdom of God. Right? It's just an embassy, it's just an outpost. So though, 
So, and because of that, I can't really be upset when someone leaves, though to be honest, it's always upsetting. If someone wants to go, I can't stand in your way and guilt you into staying. The only time I'll try and speak to someone is if I feel they're going to leave church altogether. But if you're going to go somewhere else, I can't stop you and I'm not going to guilt you to try and make you somehow, you're going to miss out on what God wants to do. I can't do that. It's not my role. But, but also I want to say that I've only been in two churches in my life. Right? The church I got saved in, which is Paradise Community Church and Emerge Church that I'm pastoring now. So leaving a church isn't something you just do at a drop of a hat either. Right? You do it something prayerfully because I actually believe most of the offences that we go through are actually designed by God to deal with a measure of pride that's in our lives. Right? So I'm not looking at anyone when I say that. Right? I always say to pastors, as a, as a joke, I say, when people come, it's always God. When they leave, it's always a devil. Uh, you must be radically generous. You must steward your finances with radical stewardship. You know, Nina and my relationship, Nina handles the money and I handle the giving. But I'm generous and Nina's a steward. I'm a spender, she's a saver. That works for us because we should be radical in our giving but completely thoughtful in our spending. Spend only on what you have to, only on what you need. Nina doesn't need the latest iPhone or the latest kind of name brands. She loves it when she gets a bargain or something at one of the uh, thrift stores or one of those places. She loves that. She goes to every supermarket. We learnt after getting married, one minute, we will never survive if we shop together. <laughs> Just buy it. But it might be cheaper at home. I couldn't care less. Buy two of them. Right? Like, it would just drive me crazy. We decided early we're never shopping together. We love each other too much. <laughs> uh, but when it came to provision for the vision just recently, I remember we were driving down to the Gold Coast and, and I just said to her, this is the figure I want to give. And she's like, what? 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 And we stopped at Yatla Pies, right, to get their amazing cream apricot pies. They're amazing, right? So we always do that. And so we, we got this, up and, and she's walking out. Are you sure that's what you want to give, right? And then she goes, guys, the pie, because are you sure you want to give that? And we just spent some time talking about it, and I told her why we came to that amount, and, and she trusted me with that. But because she's been such a great steward, that's why we're actually able to give what we're able to give. So I just want to say you need to be radically generous, but you actually need to be a radical steward as well. So let me give you some Mark Elmendorp-isms, things that after 30 years I think are just true. So I did a psychological test once, and it said that, this literally said, it came back and said, there are observations that you believe to be true and you base everything on their truisms, right? So how you think is based on what you think are true. So here are some things that I think are true and you can't change my mind. I should get one of those signs, right? <laughs> change my mind, right? So uh, number one is I've needed Nina to do this. I could never have done the things of ministry without Nina. Nina's been my strength, my bedrock, my encourager, the person behind me at all times. The Bible says, can two walk together unless they're agreed? Nina hasn't just supported me in ministry. She's actually agreed to, to do this journey together. I remember when we were asked to come for our interview to be pastors here at our church, they only wanted to see me. They only wanted to, me to come for the interview. And I said, well, if I can't bring Nina, I'm not coming either. Right? Because we're a package. You get one, you get the other. And so one of the things is I completely have needed Nina to do what I've done. Number two is I've always felt that this is what God wanted me to do, which is why I hold the leadership of this church very loosely. If someone else is meant to be doing it, I'm not going to hold on for, for grim life because it's somehow I get my self-esteem out of being the senior pastor of a merged church. Right? I, I'm doing this because I believe that God wants me to do this and I'll do this as long as I feel that God wants me to do this. 
You understand? So it's not an ego thing. It's, I believe that God wants me to do this. Number three is I know that God is good. I know that God is good. All right? Uh, all right, I've just realised the time, so I've got to go quick. All right. Is it finish what time? 10 o'clock? Quarter two. It finishes like two minutes ago. <laughs> all right. Close your eyes. But no. But uh, um, let me just say, I'll go real quick. I believe that it's in the pursuit of knowledge in the Word of God that true growth happens. 1 Peter 2 verse 1 says, Therefore laying aside all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the Word, the Word of God, that you may grow thereby. The more you want to do what's in the Word, the more you actually grow. I believe that though I'm forgiven of all sin, and that sin will not affect my place in heaven, sin will hurt me every time on this earth. I believe that there are seasons of God, but that no season lasts forever, but that the way of the upright is upward. I believe that bad things happen to good people and that good things happen to bad people because the Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. But it's not this life that is the arbiter of what's good or bad. Jesus didn't just die for this life, but that we could experience eternal life. If you concentrate or live in just one stream of thinking, you eventually end up in error. I believe that offence is in the Baha'i, the beholder. I believe that you must be able to love someone who believes completely opposite of what you do. And that the love for one another is the true test of our Christian walk. That's the true test of whether you're a Christian or not. That someone whose life is in constant crisis, maybe the band to come, is living in rebellion somewhere in their lives, whether it be in sin or whether it be in unwillingness to do something asked of them by God. I believe the deal of the century comes along every week and that there's always a cooler and better church just down the road. <laughs> so let me finish with this. It's your daily walk that determines everything. Just as my daily walk with Nina determines the strength of our relationship, it's my daily walk with Jesus that determines my relationship with him. And so I need to want to experience more of Jesus. Right? Paul said about all the things I do, it's all but dung, compared or contrasted to the excellence of knowing Jesus. So if you really want to know Jesus, he's there to be known. And last is, Salvation for a person is the most important decision that someone can make in this life. Trusting your life to Jesus. Everything changed for me. 45 years ago, when I walked into a church I had no idea about even existed. And all of a sudden, the direction of my heart and the attention of my heart was taken by Jesus. And I've walked and I've fallen and I've done all sorts of different things. But I want to say the direction of my heart has always been, what do you want, Jesus? I want to know more of you, Jesus. But it starts in you making that turn. Repentance, the Bible says, taking a turn around and starting to follow the things of Jesus. So with every eye closed and every head bowed, I just want to give you that opportunity. If you have yet to trust your life to Jesus, if you have yet to turn the direction of your life to the things of God in your life and you know that God is dealing with you right now, I want to give you that opportunity. Can you just raise your hand? I'd love to pray with you. Over here, one young lady. Over the back, another young lady. Anyone else? Anyone else? As I just look over, just keep your hands raised. I want you to all pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I trust my life to you. I make the decision to look towards you. I ask you to forgive all of the things I've done wrong. I thank you, Jesus, for dying for me and for your resurrection. Walk with me the rest of my days. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Amen. Just those who put up your hand. At the end of the service, there'll be someone just at one of our areas over there, Next Steps. And they'll give you a book and just help you, just a Bible and just a, different things just to help you in your walk with God. You know, when I got married to Nina, that wasn't the, 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 the end of something. It was the beginning of something. And giving your life to Christ, that's what it is. It's not the end of, it's the beginning of a whole new world. And it's a fantastic thing that you've done. Let's give him a hand.